Dear listeners, on this episode, we will be lit and be learning with the legendary non-binary pioneer of stage, screen, stereo, and so much more, because, between you and me, they've got their pistol in their pocket, baby, and it really is pointed at you. So, book your table at Eat the Rich, but skip the mints and chips, and brace yourself for the thrill of the one, the only, the Lana P. It was a camera on me. <laughs> Oh, I wish you'd have get, given me warning, catching me, putting me slap on, filling the pits in on me face with what? this, with me stipple brush. And you, my stipple brush was complimentary. So, uh, hello, everybody. Hello, Craig. Ah, ah, 25 years in the business. <laughs> oh, your microphone, please. Oh, oh, could you hear me? Oh, I could. I cranked up the level, but now. Oh, good. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Where were we? We're, we were about to have tea. Yeah. Oh, yes. Let me pour you a, a drop yes, there. It's not prop tea, this. This is real tea. That's right. The prop tea is actually quite expensive now because of Brexit. Oh, is yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, everything is. Can you name one good thing that's come out of bre- Brexit? No. Not a thing. Not a single thing. Yeah. Did we still it- have this shower in power. <laughs> we have uh, the biggest living crises in history yeah you know so should i pass you this oh that'd be lovely thank you so much more tea vicar there you are <laughs> darling welcome oh, to miss marple's home yes cheers thank cheers. you very much cheers. oh it's the mouse trap all over again <laughs> and of course we talked a lot of course in the audio only version that mm-hmm. people will hear uh about your role in eat the rich which shot you to prominence. Yeah. And then how long after that again was the pistol in my pocket? Was that the next year? Well, no, pistol in my pocket came first. Mm. So I recorded that in 85. It was released um, 86. Oh, I see. I actually, uh, the premiere of it was uh, New Year's Eve, 1985, yeah. Yeah. at the Cambridge Theatre on the set of... Uh, a musical called Bounty, mm-hmm. starring Sunita. Sunita, who, oh, by the way, is a huge, big fan of mine. Of, how, how could she not be? Uh, well, frankly. yes, I mean, I've known her since uh, she was 18. And the wonderful, uh, the co, uh, the, the uh, her co-star was uh, David um, Essex. Oh, wow, okay. So, so for we the were, original we, Rock On Gentleman. Yeah. And also, uh, Shock Treatment fans, Sunita That's is right. in the band, uh, the Oscar Drill and the Bits group. Yes. So... Um, anyway, so uh, it was a, a big party, that uh, New Year's Eve party they threw uh, in the um, uh, Piccadilly Theatre. Yeah. And um, so on the bill was myself, mm-hmm. Marilyn. Oh, yeah. And Boy George. And that's when I first met Marilyn and Boy George. And uh, so that was the genesis of, you know, uh, pistol and a lot of things, you know. Sure. And um, yes, so I always remember uh, the sound check in the afternoon when I first met Boy George and he came in, you know, he was a karma chameleon look. Era, you know? yeah. And um, anyway, he sort of like looked at me, you know, in that sort of sneering working class queen way well she didn't actually realize she was meeting the devil's fucking mother uh you know because you can take the girl out of grimsby but you can't take the grimsby out of the girl you bet nor the jelly deals either and um but um, anyway and she said uh or george said to me um oh so you are the drag queen they've hired for the night are you uh, you know, and I said, well, he didn't say it in a northern accent. It was a lot more like, eh? And um, I said, uh, no, actually, I thought that's why they'd hired you. And anyway, George knew that um, he'd met his match in vicious... Quick, repartee. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, Anyway, you know, we, we sort of got on very fine and very perfunctory. Mm-hmm. And um, I always remember him coming in with a Perspex suitcase mm-hmm. about uh, 14 by 12. And you could see all his uh, clinic must have been sponsoring him. Sure. Then, because it was just jam packed with um, clinic in there. Yeah. And I was very much like, mm, 
Mum, I like your slap bag. Anything for brown skin. <laughs> 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 but um, I have to say, Marilyn yeah. was absolutely charming from the offset. Oh, okay. When Marilyn came in, there was no uh, airs or graces or... High-handedness or, yeah. False unassumingness with Marilyn. We mm -hmm. just nattered. And Marilyn was the most beautiful uh, thing you know, mm -hmm. at the time, you know. I mean, he, you know, he even made my nipples go like football studs. <laughs> and, Irresistible um, to everyone. Yeah. This is a very high camera angle, isn't it? It's lovely. Mm. In fact, so I have made him hang it from a rope from the ceiling. That's right. We have the cameraman <laughs> in a, uh, a harness. It's in place where the lampshade should be on the ceiling. That's good. But then it deflects the light just the way we wanted it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's lovely. It's quite good. I mean, the last time we didn't capture this on camera, but the workmen were banging their equipment, if you will, against the window for your mm, attention. Well, that's because they saw me coming up the road. <laughs> <laughs> And they wanted to come up and see you. Yes. Sometime and another time. Yeah. <laughs> time and time after that. <laughs> cheers, everybody. Have yes. a nice sip on me. Exactly, yes. Cheers. And cheers to you, uh, Lana. And it's been lovely getting to know you. And um, I was thinking about, when you mentioned George, the Blitz Club. And I was curious if you ever went to the Blitz. Um, no, I never went to the the Blitz. But, of course, you know, I was the big tranny of the day. Uh where Taboo, you know, was concerned, you know, Pistol in My Pocket was the anthem of Taboo. Yeah. Lee Bowery was my uh, closest friend, you know, at the time. And uh, so, no, I just missed, uh, well, no, I did actually go to the Blitz twice. Mm -hmm. But that is when Steve Strange moved it to the Camden Palace, which is Coco now. Oh, okay. Which is soon to uh, reopen after its big fire mm -hmm. and um, that was mysterious <laughs> and, uh, club fires how do those it's so funny the, yes. those things isn't it they, they yeah. just they're so prone to bad wiring isn't uh, it? yeah special lightning yeah and um, but I always <laughs> think that about religious people they're so prone to bad wiring oh yeah that's you know, true and anti-abortionists oh god are so prone to bad wiring America is riddled with uh, bad wiring I right know now. that's why I'm not coming anymore well unless you beg <laughs> and pay handsomely right? yeah yeah absolutely there's got to be handbag uh, handbag <laughs> <laughs> involved um but uh, sorry what was the question Alan oh, Craig that's okay uh, I was, we were talking about I was curious if you'd been to Blitz Club and, but you led me into something that I'm really oh, curious yes. about so, so yeah. yes so when Steve moved Steve Strange moved the Blitz Club to the Camden Palace I went twice yes. so I can say I've been to the Blitz Club but not to the original place in Parker Street sure. where you basically had to walk around on your knees the <laughs> ceilings were so low yeah. and the carpets were that thin Great for dancing carpets. And shit. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but we've all played those places, haven't we? That's what makes us authentic and real. Exactly. That's what you know, it's I mean, about. I used to take my own bucket to places. Really? Yeah. Well, wow, so because you would, what would the dressing room facility? Oh be God, like for you, you know, I don't know about people taking Epsom salts. So much shit on the wall. I think they'd been doing somersaults while they've been shitting themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, people uh, they they had to get. It's hard sorry. to get exercise back then when you're. What was that? Hard to get exercise when you were on the road. So you try to. But combine the gymnastics. Well, well, you know, I never did any somersaults. As I say, I used to take my own bucket. <laughs> now, um, with uh, Lee Bowery, I'm curious about uh, when you first met Lee. Yes. Uh, so when I first met Lee, let me think. Um, uh, it was 1980 one or two uh -huh. and i think he'd just arrived in um the uk london and i had a friend trevor who was a harry krishna or former harry krishna devotee uh -huh. and a vegetarian which you had to be when you were a harry krishna devotee it was what was that one of the things that put you off being a harry krishna because you had mentioned the last time we talked you know, about that what put me off uh, being a harry krishna was uh, you have a light bulb moment where you you realize that uh monotheism and uh on all levels is a construct it's mm -hmm. a man-made construct and it's a boys club 
Sure. Yeah. You know. That's why all these cult uh, leaders and have. It's, yes. They, you yeah, know, they, and it's, oh, the story is always they ended up sleeping with everybody. Yes. Yeah. You know, and um, I didn't mind that bit. And, <laughs> but no one else uh, could sleep with anyone. Being That's a sacred the... slag. <laughs> and uh, this way to the grotto, Christmas has come early. <laughs> um, but no, you know, there's a, there's such a lot of hypocrisy uh, yeah. surrounding, you know, uh, so entrenched in it. And. Um, but anyway, you know, this obviously the main tenets of it all, you know, are to do with the golden rule of being human. So mm-hmm. why do you need a uh, a, uh, you know, a religion strict... and dogma? Yeah. You know, that contradicts itself. You should right. understand yourself as a conflicted human being anyway, because being in the human condition is very conflicted, mm-hmm. you know, and that's your only real trial and tribulation is to be assessing yourself you know is to really um about ascertaining what human empathy is what your purpose is you know and yeah. i do think without being nicey nicey um is that you know i do think that you have to be kind to yourself because it's all an inside job yeah and it's through that that you're able to uh have a good um assessment of uh you know other others really so it is all about you know doing stuff that uh nobody else uh, you know doing stuff for somebody that you know could never pay you back yeah and there's not enough of that you know we're, we're very sold on uh today you know we're all commodified sure you know we all use a bloody phone uh watch the george orwell orwell's uh bloody uh tablet which is a tablet on the wall that he warned us about or you know a tablet in our hands you know so we're all um you know commodified and and really i think what we should be doing is putting everything down and going inside Mm -hmm. and really uh, uh, priding ourselves um, on uh, empathy, Mm. really. Yeah. You know, that, you know, not about success, not about how how many followers we've got on Instagram or, you know, TikTok talk or any of the other uh platforms you know um you know all these people who who are desperate to have all these followers you know well to me that's like fame it's like the bigger you are in the fame stakes Mm -hmm. the more you need to fill the void sure now did you ever feel that feeling when you had the first wave of attention and notoriety? Oh, yes, I did. Because, you know, as you know, I came out of the womb on a chaise long singing, I'm just an old-fashioned girl with an old want to take me cruising on an ocean liner. Show me places I've longed to see, monsoon. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so, yes, I mean, it's like, and because I come from a very damaged dark background yeah um and because i come from a big family and i'm the baby of the family it's that typical usual psychological uh thing where as the baby you have to scream higher louder be more expressive in order to get the attention from the others you know before you so there was that and then because there was no love in yeah. my family, yeah. I had to get it from elsewhere. And so it was either from food, mm. because when love isn't available, food usually is. Right. And also love and approbation from strangers. And the funny thing is now it's not so much about that. It is for my own fulfillment as a creative artist person and because i'm more consummated within the person that i am sure i don't feel that i need to have so many people around me to tell me how great i am i already know how worthy Mm -hmm. i am it's more about the fulfillment of your artistic impulse absolutely yeah but in the early stages it is about filling the void so get the attention from 
two people, ten people, twenty people, oh, two hundred people. Let's oh, two thousand people. Mm -hmm. You know, five million people joining the comic strip on Channel Four, being yeah. their first out loud and proud non-binary tranny dress up, whatever you want. You yeah. know, uh, although these days I I wouldn't give myself labels. You know, I think labels are lazy, and I you know today I wouldn't even refer to myself as trans, I would say, um, in all honesty, and without a, a, an ounce of irony, that I am a field of light dancing of itself, mm. you know, because we're all multidimensional uh, beings. And that's how I see it, you know, and I'm glad that I'm somebody who's had life's knocks and, and experiences in order to realise that... Um, I, I have the gift of looking beyond form, you mm -hmm. know. So all this people giving themselves label, and I understand it if it if, if it makes them comfortable and gives them an answer to something. But I don't. For for me, the the issue has never been in the wrong body of any kind. The issue is being in the body at all really because <laughs> you know when you realize that we're actually not humans having a spiritual experience we are spiritual beings having a human experience mm -hmm. then all that crap and labels and boxes you know just go out the window or you know go to recycle or something <laughs> right down the alleyway somewhere. yeah yeah up your alley go <laughs> <laughs> Which is fun for everyone. Well, yeah, well, ideally, that's been yeah. for me. <laughs> now, when did you? Uh, uh, when would you think a bit of a spit and a good shove? And <laughs> I'll leave it with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when do you think that you started to shift over from the filling of the void? to realizing that while that's all well and good mm. to have the attention, which, because there's nothing wrong with having the attention no. and affirmation. Uh, was there a time that you could think of specifically where you sort of sat and reckoned with that? Well, I think, you know, when I did, um, oh, uh, but, but, you know, may, may I just say about Please. fame, Absolutely. I think that um, it's like any sort of addiction, Yeah, you know, it's like when the addiction starts dictating to you and has a hold on you, that's when you're in big, prob big serious uh, danger. Yes. And I think that um, I started to realise that fame can warp your personality to the point of not knowing who you are or where you are. Sure. And the bigger you are, the more yes people you have around you so that you lose your ability of what it is to be, a hum you know, to be human, to be a proper person. That's why people ended up in, um, what's that place? Uh, Priory? Well, there's Priory here, but uh, Betty Cart, Betty Ford, uh, Betty Ford, you know, yeah, sure. that's that's why, you know, those places were set up. So, um, but I think... It was a gradual process with me uh, waking up to the vicissitudes and the the vapidity mm -hmm. of fame and success because it was like, oh, this isn't an all time fix, you know. Sure. This, you know, this doesn't really fix me, even though I've gotten all this what appears to be love yeah. and appreciation, it hasn't really fixed me because I haven't done any inner work, you know. Sure. And I think you have to come to show business centred, grounded. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you're in show business, you always have to, you know, uh, maintain mm -hmm. that, you know. And I think you have to be your own best critic mm -hmm. and that can be terrifying because that's like meeting yourself you is, know. is there ever a danger or have you found the danger of the slippery slope of being your best critic or most honest critic in that it can sometimes go over too far and that you're too critical about what you're doing well i suppose you know that there is that danger but i, I but the thing is if you've built um a, a safety net a foundation you're able to bounce back it's like you know it's like anything it's like um you know, the darkness might come, you know, because we all have these very deep, dark uh, 
element side mm-hmm. to us. And, you know, you, you have to have a discernment which says, well, thank you for reminding me, but I'm not buying into it today. Sure. You know. And we can all have bad days yeah. where that takes the driver's. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, also... What what happened with uh, Eat the Rich? Uh, because you know I was like the only person of that type sure. back in the eighty six, eighty seven. You know, sure. and and just to give some context for folks who ha- have not yet discovered the majesty of it, because there's some younger folks who are, are unaware, especially in America, of the comic strip. Sadly, uh, which I was made aware of, thankfully, via MTV. Uh, the comic strip was a group of like sort of a coalition of comedians, right? Like Rick Mayall, Ben Elton, yes, um, Peter Richardson, yeah. And Peter Richardson was the, sort of the ringleader. Yeah, he if, he if was he was like the the producer and my Svengali. Yeah, um, I you know they'd started a couple of years before I came into it. I was about twenty two, twenty three when I was asked to be in it, and I was um, basically I was uh, homeless. Uh, squatting in, I think it was Graham Greene's old house in Powys Square. Mm -hmm. And I'd moved in during the Notting Hill riots of the early 80s. And um, next door but one to me living in, uh, you know, nice house, nice flat, was Keith Allen, Lily Allen's father, Mm -hmm. the actor Keith Allen. And um, anyway, I was on the swings one day with my blonde cropped crew cut hair and the pink and blue triangle on the side and my sylvester jellyfish sandals and my uh acid green lycra um you know lycra pants and and a pink sequin dusty springfield 60s top in midday (laughs) as you do as you you know as you do thinking well this is just the underwear, love, what you staring at. And um, if I was as ugly as you, I'd fucking stare at me as well, bitch. <laughs> and so it was that kind of attitude I had at 2021. 20, and uh, so anyway, Keith Allen came on, must have noticed me. And, I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you were great at the swings. I think that's probably sorry. what it was. You were great on the swings. That, that's the that's what and, attracted yeah. him. And um, anyway, he came on the next swing and started chatting. I thought, oh, it's a bit of trade, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it turns out that he's a comedian, alternative comedian. And um don't know what was alternative about it, because when I went to see the fucker, it never made me laugh. So it was not... <laughs> You know, uh, no alternative. That's the alternative to it. Yeah. It's comedy without the laughs, which is, well, you, know. you know, should be done under the Trades Description Act. <laughs> and um, so anyway, um, it, uh, he, he says, says to me, oh, I've got this, um, I've got this um, television show coming up and it's on the new channel four oh yeah uh channel and that was uh, new a few years uh, new right at that time would that be no, it right was, uh, this 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 was where you know this was like the uh again the je- the premiere of the of channel four yeah of channel four okay right because prior to that it was just the bbc one two and three is that yeah i think so okay. yeah it was we only had three channels yeah mm-hmm. so um anyway um it's this youth program, youth yeah. program, and uh, he, he said, uh, oh, he'd love me to take part in it, doing something. So anyway, he said, oh, I'll knock on your door. He hadn't. So the channel had gone for two weeks. So I went, scouted him down at his offices and I said, what about this part you promising me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. So we wrote something there and then. It was the NBA embryonic episodes of something called the bullshitters oh yeah under titled uh roll out the gun barrel which <laughs> was a kind of send up of a television series we had here with lewis collins and martin sheen called the professional oh okay and yeah. um anyway so robbie coltrane yeah. was in it this thing i played the kidnapper in it uh elvis costello was in it you can go to youtube it's on there that's right yeah <laughs> and um and uh so 
Yes, so, so you know, this thing transpired. But the first thing that I did on Channel 4 was kind of like a little episode at uh-huh. of the bullshitters. Yeah. And um and uh Stephen Frears was really my first director. It's a good starting place. Y- isn't yes, it? you know, and I think like um he got his idea for the Queen oh, okay. based yeah. on me. Yeah. Because you know he'd obviously already worked with her with uh, a very competent one mm-hmm. can take good direction. And uh, expects quality material and distinguished cars. <laughs> Indeed. For four, for four, for four, for four. <laughs> and um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, then came the comic uh, strip presents uh, series. Got a telephone call for Peter Richardson because Peter Richardson was in the embryonic episode at Sudden the Bullshit is mm-hmm. on Channel 4 and Keith Allen's uh, show Whatever You Want yeah. is called. And uh, then uh, 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 Peter Richardson gave me a ring in a bed sit that I'd found after being homeless yeah. in uh, the area of London where I live now, which is like the Hollywood Hills of London. Yeah. And Jude Law live round there mm-hmm. and Alan Bennett and Rachel Weiss and Daniel Craig. Everybody has property round there. And of course, you know, I say hello to everyone. You know, a it's lot tiring, of, but to I be s- so loved. It's, I uh... say hello to a lot of famous people and some of the fuckers even say hello back. But, <laughs> um, but um, Yes. So anyway, he uh, Peter Richardson gave gave me a call in the bed. Sit. Did I want to be part of the uh, comic strip presents with Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders, Ab, Ab Fab, Rick Mayel, uh, Adrian Edmondson, Daniel Peacock, mm-hmm. all these Nigel Planer, Nigel Planer, um, all these wonderful white middle class talents who were very anti-establishment at the time, you know. Uh, And then me, you know, the freak that hadn't been to university except university, (laughs) Y-O-U, university. And um, would I like to join and would I like to uh, help them script things that I'm in, which I did, you Mm. know, I come up with... uh, few good lines you know um for example when i was at uh, the pa to gary dreadful in the susie episode mm. and i do a scene with uh dawn french and of course i was alan pillay then and um you know had that queer identity mm-hmm. and uh hell i wrote the line uh um uh, Dawn says to me, her character. So how do you like being homosexual? Is it fun? No, not really. In fact, I never really wanted to be gay, but I was, you know, forced into it by the recession. Oh, what a pity. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I'd write mad, you know, sort of uh, wonderful self-deprecating and deprecating... um, uh, you know, lines like that just yeah. have a dig at society and the mores of the time. Which so. makes sense too, especially as a fan and getting to know you through those programs. Mm-hmm. The consistency yeah. of the tone, of the uh, the tenor, really, of yes. your lines yeah. was all, all the way through. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I and of course you know being a big personality, I would uh, my my personality and attitude and uh, towards things and the way that I saw things in a very sort of like deranged way would eventually influence the writers Pete Richards and Peter Richardson, so they knew kind of how to write for me. Sure. In the end, yeah. And, and then eventually, Eat the Rich is basically written for you, right? Well, yes, yeah. And so um, I did a few of the comic strip presents episodes and. Um, Then they said, oh, we need to write you uh, a major motion picture. You know, I sound like Elizabeth Taylor then. (laughs) Now, here's the award for a major motion picture. (laughs) Richard! And it goes to... (laughs) So... (laughs) But, um, yes, so they wrote a movie, The Rich, for me, and... uh, 
and very relevant today, very relevant in these fraught times fraught strained times you know times could be better the the biggest disappointment i think is that from 30 32 years ago however old it is is that we end up in this position where we still have greedy damaged world leaders who have an ideology of whether you see it as evil or not. I tend to see it as malicious and yes, evil. Yes, I agree with you. Um, you know, I know that the right wing, you know, have an ideology which is, uh, I'm all right, Jack, which is, all right, Jack, but why aren't you letting everybody else be an all right Jack? Yeah. You well, know, why are you going to, to such lengths to keep people well, from being all right? Abs- yeah, truly. So um, that's the biggest disappointment with Eat the Rich, the fact that it is supposed to be a comedy because I think we are living in a fucking comedy because we're certainly ruled by clowns. Yeah. You know, and like that fucker in the... the Kremlin, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, these people, they don't, you know, these clown kings, you know, they don't make a, you know, somewhere like that, a palace, they make it a fucking circus like Bozo the Clown Johnson and the rest of them, you know. Yeah, well, and and also the leader, I'm I'm blanking on the name, but who's the the prime minister in Eat the Rich? I'm blanking on the name. He's a boxer. boxer Oh, yeah, Nosha Powell. Nosha Powell. It's very much like Trump as well. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, um, that was, uh, what do you call it, Uh, Nostradamus did. Uh, oh yeah, the the, the, the prediction. The, prediction, uh, yeah. you know. So eat the rich was a prediction for Trump, I think. Yeah, you know, and and Nosha Powell is to me, he, he, he's very indicative of, of what Boris Johnson is. I mean, said yeah. Boris Johnson, you know, was given a a good education, you know, and speak for four for four for four, and uh, you know, quotes, you, you know, Shelley or whatever the fucking thing he yeah. does to quote and bamboozle, you know. But that whole government to me is beyond a government. So it's more like a fucking smash and grab raid. Yeah, you know, they they. They're 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 not a government. They're a Nazi ideology, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, especially with that fucking thing, you know, the Home Secretary uh, Patel. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, she's you know, she would never have gotten into this country under her policies. Right. Which you is know, the crazy her parents making, would yeah. never have gotten here. Yeah. You know, and it's like. You go and live in Rwanda only a few weeks before. Yeah. You, the, the, the British government were trashing Uran, uh, Ugan, uh, uh, Rwanda. Rwanda. Well, Uganda's another one as yeah. well. Uh, Rwanda, because of their human rights but now that's, abuses. Yeah, which is, and then they're so keen to send people. There. Yeah, absolutely. At such great expense. So, you know, this is, this is the deranged cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And, her innate maliciousness Mm -hmm. because she is from and i don't mind saying it she is from that horrible indian caste system that my father was from oh and she's from the vaishna part of that indian caste system where they're the merchants and money lenders Mm -hmm. you know and if you believe in the uh, the story of jesus she and the rest of them would have been the ones that he would have thrown out of the temple craig would you like me to pour you another cup of tea oh well lana that would be simply delightful thank you very much oh and it's still warm wonderful that's good oh it's a good pot this it is warm like our chat Warm like our discussion and our hearts. And Thank our you. hearts. And you at home as well. Well, they obviously got it from TK Maxx because it's a good one, this <laughs> kettle. It's funny. TK Maxx is TJ Maxx in the States. I have no oh, idea. TJ, so yeah, I have no idea. what the. Thank I you very much. I might have tip. But, oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> Some things we just can't help. Oh, well, right? you weren't looking. And... <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about uh, the caste system and also the monotheism uh, that, that pollutes... <laughs> Yes, so, so uh, you know, the, the thing is, it is like this uh, pollution of uh, the mind and the... the Morals, really, or the theoretical Well, it, well the thing is, you know, it, it's, it's like 
religion does actually make an awful lot of people sick, twisted, twitched fuckers. Yeah. You know. Without and, compassion. And, you know, the, the total antithesis to what the message it was supposed to be. Right. You know. Yeah. And uh, the message was love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Yet we experience all through our lives now in the 21st century the lack of loving mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. You know, and especially by the damaged leaders at the top. Yeah. Using their religion as a coverlet to justify mm -hmm. their amoral, duplicitous, and Machiavellian behaviors. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure that they're so twisted. I'm sure the likes of Patel is so twisted that she, with the rest of them, before they go to bed, don't pray. They think about what damaging policy they can come up with yeah. uh, for tomorrow in order to uh, disseminate on the people. Yeah. You know, the further, they're you know. a fucking death cult. Yeah. You know, as far as I'm concerned. And I absolutely loathe and detest their class. Yeah. You know. And in the States right now, with all the anti-abortion stuff, what's being made very clear is that that's been the whole plan for them. Yes. The entire, however long, 30 years, that's all they care about are these insane, oppressive maneuvers. Uh, if, if they could discover yeah. uh, in, in na you know, natal investigation that this clump of cells, yeah. this embryo was going to turn out trans or homosexual, lesbian, bi, questioning i don't know why the lgbts have to get the cue at the question why do they have to get it give it to the cis hetero dominant yeah. normative yeah let them question you know. <laughs> let the cue be for queer yeah the good you know, old uh, label yeah it's like oh i'll give you the last bond you know like <laughs> after, I, you know the crust is hanging off it but oh you have it i don't fucking want it have it back you know yeah it's like you know when people try and give me money on on stage i go what are you giving me fucking money for i'm black not fucking poor you know, <laughs> you know? um but but um we know that if an embryo, if they could uh, uh, decipher that an embryo was going to be LGBTQ, they would abort it. Yeah. Where are your morals now? You know, and if you want all these uh, babies born out of love, born out of rape, yeah. born out of, uh, you know, into starvation, yeah. into lack of education, into homelessness, into poverty. Go and fucking raise them in the Senate. Yeah. You know, yeah. you take the fucking responsibility and don't tell natal females or any other kind of self-identifying female what to do with their bodies. Right. And stop negating the fact that the human condition in itself is sacred. You're so fucking connected with your sky god. You've got such a fucking hotline there yeah. based in self shame. So sorry mm. my bra keeps pushing me <laughs> on things and, and and never has there been a group Sorry my head is gonna spin in and me <laughs> green soup's gonna come out. Yeah we didn't order that because I knew that would happen. Oh yeah oh cool yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well at least we got some bread to dunk in it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and two different kinds, which is yeah. nice. <laughs> and the other thing is uh I think the sex lives of no other group are more twisted, sad, and filled with uh shame and uh cover ups than the same people. They well, want to legislate everyone else's. Well, look, look, look at look at the male uh, evangelist on big family values, and what do we find? You lift the veneer of that social civility, and there they are with the rent boy, yeah, or the dominatrix, yeah. you know, or the wife has got a strap on on, yeah. Is Anne Summer still open, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Coco Lemire, <laughs> Lady Bonnie, she'll probably have some. 
<laughs> I imagine. And, yeah. and all that stuff sounds well, all well and good, except they want to crush it down and pretend that that is the thing that is ruining the world, yet they seem to have an abiding interest yes. in all these things. Which yeah. is, that's part of the madness, again, the cognitive dissonance. The cognitive dissonance, the total hypocrisy yeah. of it all, you know. And I just think conservative, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, I'm not totally left, I'm not totally right, sure. you know, I'm probably right down the middle uh, with stuff, you know, and um, I don't like murky things, uh -huh. really. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to be judging somebody on something that they are consenting to, yeah. which is neither of detriment to themselves or anybody else. Exactly. And I do, you know, this is my issue with conservatism, yeah. is that I find it de developmentally arrested. Yes. Yeah. You know. It's focused on all the wrong things. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you've hit the nail on the head. And it's there. just about subjugating people yeah. to make themselves feel better. Yes, yeah. 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 And, and, and you know, ju just imposing a serfdom on... And that, that's what it is. That's what it's about. It's people that want to just feel superior to other yeah. people, which yeah. is the antithesis of yeah. whatever they say yeah. that their great lord... Are you smoking? Are you turning into Fenella Fielding? Carry on screaming. <laughs> do, do you remember Fenella in that I movie? don't, but I like to think do that. Do you mind if I smoke? She went, and then all this uh, smoke, smoke poured started out of her? billowing out of her. Uh, she was playing a vampire. Have you never heard of Fenella Fielding? No, I haven't. I, oh, you must look, look Fenella up, darling. I certainly she will. She died recently. She was 90. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she had a good long run then yes I, i'd met because i was understudying in 82 at the chichester festival theater a uh entertainer uh bertie shredding who's like a big black mama with blonde crew cut hair we're back to the blonde crew cut hair yeah, yeah. and um she sandy wilson who wrote the boyfriend the musical oh, okay. wrote a film uh, wrote a, a musical for um um bertie's mm-hmm called Valmouth, which was kind of like, um, uh, what's that, Brigadoon, you know, where this magical place appears, you know, uh -huh. it's very exotic. And um, anyway, she she couldn't do it, Bertie's, because uh, I think she was very ill at the time. So Cleo Lane uh, did the part. <laughs> and my big best shoes go nick and knock 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 and knock. Nick and knock and knock. <laughs> and I've got magic fingers where I touch the magic lingers. And um, <laughs> so, and Fenella, the, the revival yeah. of it in 82 was with um, Fenella. Um, and uh, I also remember Fenella's uh, lines. Um, I wonder if you could show me the way to the cathedral. <laughs> and Finna was sort of like, you didn't know whether she was boss-eyed or anything, you know, but, but it was that kind of look. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so a definite, a distinct attitude, but you couldn't quite discern what it was. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, there was um, uh, Sir Bobby Heltman uh -huh. was in it, who was familiar. in the movie Red Shoes with Norma Shearer, and he played the child catcher in the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Oh, okay. And um, there was uh, Jane Birkin's mother, Judy Campbell was in it, Mark Winter. All these, uh, well, they they were like British icons, yeah. you know. Which And you've worked a lot with British icons uh, throughout the years. I mean, you are a British icon in my eyes. Oh, that's nice. Uh, and I'm curious also about... Uh... I'm a star in other people's eyes. A fucking disaster. And, <laughs> um... <laughs> 25 years. It's a good and concept my album. Figures my yeah. own. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you kept it, Lana, and added so much to it. <laughs> you just keep developing the career. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like my ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you started working with the comic strip, you mentioned that they all went to university and you had not, mm. you'd been homeless. What was the. Um, I guess the relationship like with those folks uh, and did you find that you had any antipathy towards working with folks that maybe were from a different background, given that you had such a hard scrabble upbringing? Now that's a word I haven't heard for a long time. Antipathy. Um, well, 
No, because I was a bit oblivious to it. I was just interested in being a star Ooh, on the telly. You yeah, know? sure. And uh, people coming up to me for autographs, which was like that sometimes. But, but you know, people would come up and go, fucking queer nigger. You know, and things like that. Yeah, fucking queer cunt. You know, you'd get a lot of that. When you were uh, working the working men's clubs and that, oh no, that when era, after or? television, oh yeah, uh, you know yeah, when yeah, seen yeah, on sure. television, yeah, and um, but you know that's what I mean about fame. It's not about discovering how many people love you for being you. It's about how many people hate you for just being there and uh, just think it's fair game to attack your intersections. You sure, know? but. Um, but sorry, I didn't realise what your question was. So antipathy. Um, no, I, I, I was oblivious to stuff. Yeah. I was just with these brainy people that I felt a bit intimidated about because they were very well read, you know, and they were young, you know, as well themselves. And, you know, they were, you know, it's like when, you, when you're around academics, it's like when you're around a lot of gay people, uh, you know, it, life becomes a competition. <laughs> in you know how much you know and how much you can do uh, yeah, and how much sure. you can say and how much you can outwit and i th- find that especially with academics it's a competition in who is the best thinker you sure. know yeah but um i soon got past that because you know if i didn't you know have the kind of severe ego that I had, I'd feel inferior, but I fucking well don't. And right. um, well, also, you know, I mean, clearly, because then they're consulting you on scripts and they want you to write part yeah. of it. So I imagine it was a very nice feeling to yeah. sort of realize that there, the, it, maybe you didn't feel the division, but, you know, I just know from going into other worlds where it feels like an alien world. Mm. But then you're like, wait a second, I'm operating on the same plane yeah. as them. Yeah. And I'm just, uh, I imagine that was a good feeling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was, a, it was, it was a kind of, uh, it was a combination because it was all brand new worldy for me. Yeah. It was like, a dr- you know, realizing and experience the dream come true. Sure. You know, even though I was right at the uh, genesis of it, yeah. of it, but the dream was coming true. Oh, this what it feels like. I don't know whether I'm equipped for it. You know, really. So I'll just do my work. Okay. You know, which is a good response because sometimes when you feel yeah. I'm not equipped for it, it's yeah. like I'll just retreat. You know, so yeah. it, it's we're always making those choices, especially yeah. when we're young. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, such a theatrical creature am I. It was all kind of part and parcel of it. Um, but um, uh, you know, it sort of made me. You want to read more. I noticed, you know, around about that time, I was an avid reader of things. So, of course, my thinking was a whole lot better uh, or started to get a whole lot better. And my language was a whole, I mean, I mean I'm a dirty, foul mouth old cow now. <laughs> but, you know, my language was a lot more, uh, you know, more uh, quality. Sure. Well, I mean, you're quite a cunning linguist. So. Oh, really? Oh, thank you. <laughs> you did say cunning. Cunning. All right. <laughs> Keep listening out for uh, any slip ups from this one. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, that's a compliment, of ah, course. Good, good. Yeah. No, I mean, you have such a way with words that uh, it only makes sense that it's like um, when we don't have doors open to us in other uh, previously, mm-hmm. and then we do, and it's a, a I imagine, like a relief. Yeah. Uh, and uh, feeling like, oh, I, I know my role in this and yeah. I, I do quite well and I'm getting the attention, the affirmation, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, it, it was very much, you know, like that. Um, and um, yes, I suppose it's that thing when you're in Shea Company, you know, so some hopefully some of the best bits start rubbing off on you, you yeah. know. And the, but, yours on them. Yes, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot that bit. <laughs> I'm such an influencer. That's why I've only got two followers on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're well, choosy about who you let in. Yes, that's, that's what it is. I do. They're all knocking on the door. It's like my <laughs> body's a temple. There's always a queue trying to get in it on a Friday night. Well, when we spoke last time, after we stopped taping, uh, we were talking about the second or the next period of homelessness that you encountered, which was after being very 
very very famous mm. having a record out yeah the, the star of uh feature film yeah and i was wondering if you would wouldn't mind getting into uh the the lead up to that yeah well i did this stupid thing with uh somebody who was in my family and uh decided to they convinced me that um i should we should swap homes you know and um, it was because this this hideous person in my family was absolutely jealous talk about classic detrimental narcissist this is exactly what this piece of shit pardon me is so it still triggers me well you yeah know? and um so i i did this swat uh swap uh, from happening London. And of course, I had a bit of a breakdown after oh. uh, Eat the Rich because I never really was prepared for the amount of crap, you know, that came. And also uh, uh, compounded by this idiot who was a member of my family. Of course, we disown this person completely uh -huh. now. Yeah, And in fact, to the point, if somebody was to of authority rang and said this pe this person is dead i'd go do you mind i'm having my dinner <laughs> you know yeah and yeah. uh that's how much compassion that i have for this person and um anyway so i ended up out convinced to live outside of london um do you mind if I ask what was the pitch on that? What was the well, premise that? Well, well, uh, the premise and um, the pitch was to, uh, well, uh, you know, when you're not in hard London, you know, being knocked about, fighting for your space, if you just come and live in this peaceful area in the north, it will bring you down to earth, and you know the people are nice there, and you know the the uh, pace is nice and everything, but of course. It it didn't, you know, it just made me even more depressed, you sure. know. So, um, and and to describe a little bit about the breakdown, you were getting all this crap, like the people coming up to you saying horrible things. Mm. Was it also difficult to deal with the positive stuff, just because there was so much of it, and there was such a polarity between? Yes, you you could not decipher. Uh, whether somebody was going to come up and be complimentary or hostile sure. in the end. And it was just, um, I use this an analogy a lot, like putting your head into a vice, basically. Yeah. And you were having a screaming nervous breakdown inside, but yet you 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 were able to put on this, you know, sort of veneer. People were coming up to you uh, and it's, right to say that they were involved in the performing personality which wasn't necessarily the person that you were involved with because sure. you were breaking down inside you were broken down inside yeah. you know i mean i had doctors say that we're surprised you aren't in a nutty bin you know uh, with what you've had to put up up with um so you know i was in in quite a, a bad state but you know it's like how you can get an alcoholic that just functions, mm -hmm. but you know they're sick, they're ill, you know they're dealing with a disease. You but know. yet, to the outside but perspective, yet, they're yeah. they're rolling along, they're doing yes. fine, and yes, uh, and I had to do things, you know, still have to eat the rich to sort of because a lot of people, you know, because I was this extraordinary character at the time that was very unapologetic about the space they took up on this planet. Yeah. Um, wanting to do interviews, and I was doing interviews, and I did it, um, and uh, what compounded my depression at that time, back in 88, um, I did an interview. I mean, Piers Morgan phoned me up once uh, when I was living in Stockport. I mean, I'd give up this flat because I was too ill to be on my own, and friends of mine in, in Heaton Moor, Stockport, Manchester, uh, decided to look after me, and they said, you need to give up this uh, flat you're in here yeah. and come and stay with us so we can keep our eyes on you because sure. we're worried about you. So um, I was basically homeless in, you know, their home, yeah. you know. Yeah, and you didn't have your own... 
place. Yeah. Was, but of course, yeah. you know, at 18, yeah. I, I'd been totally homeless, you know, after I'd let, left the kids home. Yeah. Uh, which I was in from the age of 13 to just before my 18th birthday. But anyway, we'll go back there at some point. But sure. Anyway, so um, I, uh, Piers Morgan found my, their number and, found, uh, and phoned me one morning wanting to know uh all about dawn french and jennifer saunders and stuff and i was really gave him short shrift you know and um he said i remember him saying to me uh don't talk to your betters like that and i said what makes you think you're fucking better than me you ugly cunt yeah and don't fucking ring me again yeah. You know, and, and that's like, you're better. That's outrageous. Well, you're better because better you're, you've are you got cis, white, hetero privilege. Is that what you makes you think you're fucking better than me? Eat my shit. <laughs> yeah. No, don't. In fact, maggots fucking in shit yeah. deserve more respect from, than you, <laughs> you con. Now, fuck off. Yeah. It's never spoken to me since. That's a relief. Yeah. And, um... So, um, so that kind of was the last straw you feel at the time. No, and then, um, actually, just before I'd left uh, London to do this uh, house swap uh, with this narcissist, um, I was inv- uh, invited to do an interview with uh, one of Murdoch's papers. Mm-hmm. And they took me for a really nice lunch at the uh, Savoy and ploughed me with really a couple of bottles of Dom Perignon. Yeah. I don't drink really, only Dom Perignon. <laughs> uh, just in case there's anybody there that can afford it. And um, so they knew what they were doing. And I suspect that they knew that I was wide open kind of thing. And they did this this uh, showbiz interview with me that seemed like, um, you know, like a, a glossy showbiz interview. And then uh, what happened was they'd be asking me, inserting all these questions about Robbie Coltrane or Dawn French or Jennifer Saunders or Rick Mayer yeah. or Nigel Planer. Sure. You know, and um, and it was a real case of... Where I would go, oh, no, I don't remember them like that. I don't yeah. remember them doing that. Yeah. Oh, no, you know, Robbie Coltrane is a really nice person. He's very, very funny, yeah. you know, and he'll sort of chase you around the office, you know, uh, just to, so he can laugh at your screaming, you know, like <laughs> get lost, get lost kind yeah. of thing. And he's a really, really decent human being, Robbie. And anyway, when the actual print came out... They'd written it as if, like, this screaming black tranny, you know... Ingrate. Reprobate, yeah, yeah ingrate, um, had gone purposely to sell stories in order to discredit their erstwhile working colleagues. And this was never, ever the case, you yeah. know? And obviously, through that, again, we're talking of show business... You know, where everybody is lovely in show business, which is a myth. (laughs) Um, Because, again, you lift the veneer of social civility and there lies the rot of insecurity and nothing more that people love except other people's misery. Sure. And it is show business is chock-a-block with imposters and those with dull and parochial minds. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, the industry at the time kind of enjoyed sticking the booting rather than looking at the truth sure. of, you know, the situation. So I was kind of cast out of Comedy Camelot for a long time and I didn't do stuff for a long time, except when my, uh, there was a t- powerful TV producer called Mike Mansfield, Mm -hmm. who um, used to do this 70s show. Was it Supersonic, I think? That sounds... A a pop pop show. uh, Yeah. And um, anyway, um, 
they said, oh, we, 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 like you to get Craig Charles, one of our, you know, best entertainers, um, had a, uh, a show coming up called The Funky Bunker. Uh-huh. And obviously the name says it was a very funky type of show. Would you please agree to be the um, film reviewer on it? Mm. And I jumped at the chance, you know, and I thought, more than anything, I thought, oh, free films before anybody else. You know? <laughs> right, free, yeah. Free screenings, you yeah. know. And um, so I did that for about 13 weeks, mm-hmm. you know, that brought me back. And um, yes, so, you know, that that's the sort of thing. And, and then I did various things on cable television, uh, you know, when it started, yeah. you know, just chat shows and, mm-hmm. you know, that. And, um, and of course, um, then... A f- few years back i was asked to do celebrity big brother Mm. uh three times i turned it down Uh why did you turn it well because uh, why did i turn it down because i think it's the kiss of death for most people um i certainly wasn't prepared to be the butt of anybody's um you know jokes or being used by twisted people in television because there's a lot of them and also because of my demands i wanted a million pound (laughs) yeah with the extensions paid on top meaning tax paid on top sure agents fee paid on top yeah and the final uh requirement would be that you edit it so i win don't fuck with me, fellas. <laughs> I've been at the rodeo before. <laughs> Christine. <laughs> so um, that was my, um, you know, that's why I never got to do Celebrity Big Brother. Well, it's always interesting to know why someone would turn that down. Because also, uh, oftentimes people hear of an opportunity on TV and think, oh, well, you would do anything for that. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've never really, Craig, been the type of person um, that would, uh, opposite to popular opinion, uh, would never sell the souls to inherit the earth. It's just, you know. Well, and also this clearly is after the reckoning at whatever time that was about Mm -hmm. the value of fame versus the value of the quality of the Mm -hmm. work or how it would impact you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, well, you've, you've said it, you said, yeah, ba- basically, um, which must have been an interesting thing to navigate when you were, mm-hmm. in a sense, uh, cast out from comedy camera yes. because of being misunderstood and presented in such a terrible way. Yes. It's very hard to explain that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The exclusion, you know, exclusion o- is o- terrible. Of, it, o- yeah. of it all. Um, and but then, you know, I've never been that sort of formulaic type of queer, tranny, dress up that this, the mainstream industry, you know, likes because I'm I'm genuinely one foot in the avant-garde and, you know, the other, you know, mainstream. But I'm not the formulaic type of... Uh, Camp, queen. Queer that they yeah. want, you sure. know, or the type of tranny dress up that they want you know Mm -hmm. i'm just not an archetype you know (laughs) and you look at their um their ideas of what diversity is and it's just such an archetype and so predictable to me Mm -hmm. you know and and, um i'm you know i'm not I'm not that, and the, hence the reason why we started Lit and Learning. Lit and Learning. Um, yeah, let's is, talk about that because it, it's your it, fabulous uh, channel on YouTube. Yes, thank you. Um, Lit and Learning is about um, showcasing my own uniqueness, really. And um, I, I, I just love doing it, and it's something that other people seem to appreciate a lot yeah. and um you know and it's about me being in control you know as i say it's not that i can't do roles i mean i i you know i've played roles on stage and you know alex was a role yeah um but you know and it's not as if like i can't work with uh good producers uh good directors sure. with distinguished casts you know i know how to inhabit the internal life of a role yeah. you know um 
I mean, you, you can go and, and see my episode, my Shakespeare masterclass with one of our greatest British leading actors, Michael Maloney, you know, which is proof of how I work. Yeah. You know. Well, you're tremendously versatile. You have yeah, ab- you absolute, cover the whole spectrum absolutely. of performance. Yeah. Versatility. <laughs> that's no business. Like, anyway, oh, what happened? And, and <laughs> more tea. Yes, you know. more tea. That sounds lovely. Yeah. Um, Thank you, my dear. There you are. Lovely. Oh, oh I must get a little hand put on this watch. <laughs> there you are. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Was that enough? Oh, uh, I'll take my, if there's more in there. I thought they brought in two, but I think they brought in the, oh, they brought in the pot of water. That's This is fine, yeah. And oh, a, a, a bit of milk, please, if there's oh, some uh, remaining. Thank you so much. To continue with uh, talking about Lana Be Lit and Be Learning. So uh, you're in control. But also, you're very curious. So it's mm. this combination of wanting to learn different things. For mm. instance, the opera singer, right? And then uh-huh. there is uh, w- the cooking material as oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, the thing is, I thought, you know, I, it, it's like easy for me, you know, being an MVQ in makeup. I could have done a slap thing, but I'd done a slap thing before called the Empress of Slap, you know, yeah. uh, which was about, I don't know, about eight or nine years ago. So all those things are up there. Um, But, you know, I could have done, you know, something that everybody else is doing, but... Why? You know. Yeah. And I also thought, you know, um, celebrate age, celebrate uh, wisdom, um, step outside of yourself, which I've had to do quite a few times in order to exchange the piece of colored glass for the real diamond sure you had better work on something better (laughs) than a zircon (laughs) and um so um i just thought all right you know i can still be the star of the show but i'll be the star pupil sure so again stepping aside and letting you know this is what's good about in uh, you know chat shows is yeah. when the interviewer allows the interviewee to become the star yeah you know so that was my whole point with um lit and learning so shirley uh, bassey mm, yeah well my friend uh johnny corrigan um his brother and his sister-in-law, Betty and James Corrigan, used to own a very world-famous venue up north in Batley, mm-hmm. in Yorkshire, called the Batley Variety Club. Yeah. Now, every major star in the world played there, including Marlena Dietrich or Marlena Fleepit, as <laughs> the English call her, and um, uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, and, uh, so I'd known Shirley from about the age of 17, Mm -hmm. you know, and didn't talk to her very much or anything like that. And she was always, no, you know, everything was so exaggerated and the things were gone. (laughs) You know, and she goes, oh, they're taking me for fi- fish and chips. I go, I have fish and chips after the show. And, um, yes, so, you know, and I was just mimicking yeah. everybody. So I ended up as like the Shirley of the North work, doing all the working men's clubs and pubs as Shirley Bassey. Yeah. And then I do like Cleo Lane and then I do like Eartha and uh, do a bit of Mae Westy sort of quips and things. Cami Miranda. And, um, you know, so I was doing that sort of thing, but yeah. clubs would book me as the Shirley of the North. Sure. You know? What were the working men's clubs like, especially in the States? I don't know if there's a corollary to those. And uh, they're kind of a bit of a mystery, I think, to folks outside Britain. Well, the working men's clubs were uh, social clubs. And, um, you know, they were, um, I mean, this was like 77, 78, 79, where they were diminishing oh, okay. a bit. And, uh, you know, there was a, like a big demise because there was uh, 
the the, the political uh, situation of the mines and you know industry yeah. through Fat Thatcher, you know, going uh, down. So um, we, um, but they, you, you, how can I describe them? You had good nights and bad nights. Sure. Sometimes they liked a queer turning up in a frock. Yeah, and others. As, and other times they didn't, you know. Yeah. Um, but I didn't freaking care, me, yeah. you know. And uh, there was one club where um, they had one-armed bandits in front of the stage. Oh, this was Grimsby Town. Uh-huh. One-armed bandits right in front of the stage while you were on. Trying to do your act, and yeah. then in the interval, I complained to the concert secretary, and I said, um, "You know, if they don't stop, pe- if you don't stop them from playing those bloody one arm bandits, I'm not going on again." And he said, "Well, if you don't pay them bloody arm one arm bandits, you don't get paid because that's where your freaking wages is coming from." <laughs> wow. So you just yeah. had to lump it, you know. Yeah. And um, when I used to work the clubs in in um, the north, I had a, a, a agent big. Blonde, like Chimera, Peggy Lee, Divine, and Diana Dawes, uh, which would be like a Jane Mansfield type of character. Yeah, um, he was he was probably in his middle forties, but looked like he was in his sixties. Oh, that you know, look, yeah. he was a heavy drinker. <laughs> yeah, that does wonders for the skin. Heavy yeah, <laughs> and uh, but it, it was very exaggerated, and he won the Variety Club of Great Britain Award, which mm. was a very prestigious award, and it was big, you know, and, and all he ever seemed to say to you was, I all right, love, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I mean, honestly, you could have been laid in an alleyway with a knife in your stomach, yeah. you know, and it's still a walk past and going, are you all right, love? Are you all right? You know what, love? With the right lights and the right makeup, you could be a very big star. <laughs> Would you like a glass of water? Uh, no, it's uh, when I do Bunny's voice. Oh, uh, yeah, you. yeah. And, um, you know, that's all he ever seemed to say, you know. See yeah. you later. Got to go and get ready, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some people are more just for the stage, off stage. It's yeah. just two or three lines. Yes, yeah. and um, anyway, I, I, you know, he liked me and sort of worked me, you know, round Liverpool and all yeah. those sort, sort of Kirby and all those places up there. And then there was another drag queen called uh, Fufu Lamar. Great name. And uh, Fufu uh, used to have uh, his own club. Uh, just off Piccadilly in Manchester. And he was the one that first opened up the his property next door, the Long Bar, f- to punk. Oh, okay. Because you know, he saw, like a capitalist, the mileage in punk. Yeah. You know? So, and it's uh, where Marky Smith of the Fall uh, first played and all the buzzcocks and all those people. And you became quite good friends with Mark. Yes, I did. Um, but Fufu Lamar had a court case because Fufu Lamar used to own a sauna by the Manchester Cathedral. Uh-huh. Right. So um, anyway, so um, it had a court case, but this court case was down in London because it was all a, but in Manchester at that time. In the late 70s, there was this horrible Methodist minister called Anderton. He died recently. Uh-huh. And so I had a good dance. <laughs> and, it's good to uh, celebrate. Yeah. yeah. And, um, huh? and oh, there's a party happening downstairs. So anyway, um, so this court case was up in, uh, down in London. And uh, we, um, I, I used to step in for uh, Fufu coming because, uh, Driving back down from London. Yeah. And um, so that he was a very interesting character. Yeah. And um, I, he, they said he'd won singing competitions, but I couldn't make out how. Or what kind of competition? Who were the other people? Yeah, precisely. <laughs> you know, what on his own? You yeah. know, because he had the strangest voice. What was it? Because the greatest. Love of all. <laughs> it was very nicely to me, nicely now. <laughs> so, and you say, What did you think of that, Kurt? I used to go, Oh, it's nice. <laughs> what are you going to say? Yeah. yeah. What could you say? Yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> strong. Five quid now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it seems like you fell in quite uh, naturally with the punk scene as uh, well. Yes, because um, I used to work in this shop called the um, in Levenshoom, and I was homeless, and I was working in this shop in Levenshoom called, um, which became the Black Market Cafe. They called mm. it the Black Market Cafe, and it was one of the the first sort of combination places of clothes and cafe. Oh, sure, okay. So you know, I was running the cafe and selling the clothes for Joe and Helen Lewis. And this guy came in called Steve, who had a band called The Odd. And of course, you know, I'm there in all my life with my blonde crew cut hair. And so he says, um, they need somebody to read, you know, do lyrics with the band. Uh Would I do it? So said yes. And it was at this place in Moss Side called The Russell Club, which was a jamaican you know rasta club sure and um i was supporting a band called the fall have you ever heard of the fall nah (laughs) so um (laughs) anyway i met mark and Kay carol his manager and girlfriend at the time i was about 18 19 mark was about 20 Mm -hmm. um and um anyway we, we sort of fell in love became good mates you yeah. know um and mark just you know wanted me to do more with the fall yeah if ever you did anything with the fall you were actually a member of the fall oh. so mark um got me to do lyrics here and there when yeah. he was doing the university polytechnic circuit He'd also get me to come and just introduce him when I didn't have a band. Mm-hmm. So I'd do some of his lyrics at the, the beginning before introduce him, come on, introduce, you know, do the lyrics at the end of the, the show for him. I appeared in certain videos doing his material and stuff. I can't yeah. even remember. People remind me yeah. of them. I think there's some stuff on YouTube. Well, you've done so much stuff in, yes. in so many different areas as yeah. well. Yeah. That's, I can imagine it's yeah. hard to keep it all yeah. on file, you know? Yeah. 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 So, um, sorry about the the if you can hear the bass kicking in. Yeah. Um, downstairs, somebody's having a ninety six birthday. I think her name's Elizabeth. Elizabeth um, loves those kicker boxes. Yes, she loves the loud bass. As she hard. does, she does. She's probably on the decks. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> that does sound like her style. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> I'm the queen. Don't be mean. <laughs> I've come and check my wicked scene. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jubilee time for all of us. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jubilee time. The country's bust. Andrew's not here. Is with Epstein. And. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we won't mention Ghislaine. Uh, no, 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 no. She's. Uh... Um. So yes, yeah, so 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 that was my introduction to Marky e. Smith, and um, I went to his funeral about three years ago up in Prestwich, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, just the end of an era, isn't it? Really, even though I don't believe in death, I believe we're all energy and we're not going anywhere. Um, uh, but um, it's just uh, the attachment to mortal life and thought really mm-hmm. um so I, I did mourn a little bit because i think you cry for yourself really well sure and also the loss of the relationship and yes. that they'll never see them again yeah in, in that yeah. way and everything yeah. yeah yeah so and it's a natural part of life too yeah. that i think it's important to embrace the grieving yeah. process when yeah. it but i'm assured that they're all you know anybody that you want to see is there at the end of the tunnel waiting for you and i actually know that yeah yeah so. well and that's what's important too and then yeah. people can be with you i like your nail they're... polish by oh the way. thank you very much it's uh essie it's my favorite brand and um it's yeah the licorice undercoat and i forget the name of the top coat yeah it's nice i found this nice pink glitter top coat but i had it a... oh yeah. yeah i like that as well i like the way you blended it, it goes with your ring oh thanks for now my pull lovely your trousers up <laughs> 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 Don't mind the edit there, folks. Nothing happened. No, no nothing no, no, happened no. yet. <laughs> um, yeah. you, and, and speaking of friends and people that you've taken care of, mm. you'd mentioned to me that you took care of Pete Burns yes. for a while. Would yeah. you like to discuss that a little bit, your relationship with Pete? Well, you know, Pete was bipolar. Um, it was also, um, even though he was happy with... Uh, male pronouns um he was trans of course um but um 
he was bipolar and, um, you know, that used to bring him certain levels of trouble and uh, where being able to discern and discriminate situations. Sure. And um, he got himself into a situation uh, where he was basically roaming the street Sure. For a day. So, you know, I had to, like, take him in. Yeah. And, um, you know, just sort of help nurse him back to health, make take him to the psychiatry department um, and make sure that he'd got his depot, his proper medication. And he sort of settled down quite a lot. Got me thrown out of a studio <laughs> once, um, so I weren't very happy about that. Uh -huh. um, but um, was this to do with the smoking in the bathroom? Oh yeah, yeah. He was smoking in the men's toilet in a building that was prohibited smoking. Yeah. And um, anyway, so we had to leave the studio. I was fucking furious about it. But um, he, um, I'm saving some stuff about Pete for, oh, for my book. Sure. But um, anyway, I, I nursed him, yeah. helped nurse him back, getting his, uh, uh, you know, back on his feet in order to return him to the place, Lynn's, where he, you know, stayed and um and you can save the rest and that's fine i think it's interesting to talk about dealing with complicated friends yeah yeah and friends that, or people that you've known for a long time yeah. maybe not as close and then suddenly very close yeah when they're in a time of need yes yeah and i'm i'm sort of like that at, at the you know when people are at the most needy you know um uh, i'm quite i i live quite um a hermetically sealed life, you know, on many levels, because I don't need to have people around me to tell me that I exist. You know, I'd really like to have a quiet time. I like to be with my own head. I'm yeah. never bored when I'm present, yeah. put it that way. Sure. You know, um, but um, yeah, uh, Pete, we used to laugh because he did have this obviously very um, expanded, view of things sure and um so i mean i'd you know i just make him laugh till his sides split you yeah. know um he was a fountain of knowledge he was an avid reader and could retain a lot of stuff um i don't think he was always that truthful i mean there was a, a massive amount of embellishment <laughs> uneconomical with the truth would you say um but you know that used to make me laugh uh the way that um i left uh pete was um quite sort of tragic and sad circumstances you know i just thought god how the mighty have fallen you know mm. and i got absolutely no joy about it um, but, you know, sometimes you can be very, very drained sure. with people and you have to save yourself in the end. I think it's an important thing to yeah. mention because you can be so focused on the care of someone else mm. who is in need, who has troubles. But then if they can't, if they're either unable or unwilling to mm. uh, meet you in the energy department. Yeah. Well, well, uh Pete, if you allowed him, and he did this with a lot of people, absolutely sucked the life out of them. And that wasn't going to happen with me, with anybody. Yeah. You know. And Did uh, it ever? Did you ever have, like, one bad egg that came in and managed to... Well, I think that there's been quite a few bad eggs around me that have attempted, you know. And as I say, um, I, it certainly wakes you up to classic narcissist syndrome mm, yeah. and and those that suffer with disassociation syndrome yeah. so um yeah so you know it just got to the point where um it's like no you need to go and you need to allow social services now to take over because i am not a psychiatric nurse you know i'm not the welfare state you know you need to 
put your hands in the hand. You know, you need to put your life in the hands of these people, yeah. whether you like it or not. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's such a mad, mad scenario with Pete. But I will always never, ever forget his absolute generosity. Mm -hmm. He was the type of person that would give you the shirt off his back, you know. Well, mm -hmm. he was a Leo. Oh, okay. You know, right, like, like you. Very generous. Yeah. 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 And a few other folks I'm curious about, uh, back to Eat the Rich. Mm -hmm. What was it like to work with Lemmy? Oh, well, fun. Um, sometimes he'd be offensive and get a slap down for it. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, especially when he misgendered, you know. Oh, okay. And I would say, uh, just because somebody's asked you to call them a certain, uh, address them and refer to them as the gender of their liking and satisfaction lemmy doesn't mean to say that they want to suck your cock or have you shove it up the shitter <laughs> right or wash your stinking fucking feet yeah yeah so there so, is so show a modicum of respect because you will notice that the star of this show says lana pile co-starring Lemmy, the, yeah, yeah. Too, you know, but um, no, he, he was, you know, and he'd take that on uh, board, you know, from like that typical rock and roll, heavy metal, polarized, yeah. you know, pool scenario, you know, where, again, I've cognitive dissonance a lot of it, yeah. you know, where it's so kind of like... Um, Pa pantomime drag posing as um, anarchy, you know. Sure, and as macho. Yeah, you know, and it's like, don't give me fucking macho because I know three glasses of, of Jim Bean and you'd be wanting to lick me legs, suck me titties, and then <laughs> fuck me like a porno queen. <laughs> so we know what you're all about. And he often had more than three glasses of Jim Bean, right? Oh, well, he wanted to buy me a whole crate. <laughs> um, Quite fond of the speed. Well, yeah. I mean, very publicly Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. But he, you know, he, he and the Pogues, Shane McGowan, uh -huh. and that and the Pogues, um, they'd arrive on set at... Um, 7 a.m. in the morning, you know, sort of a little bit worse for wear. And you think, oh, really they've, not had a, they've not had a good <laughs> night's sleep. Well, in right. fact, they'd not been to sleep at all, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but. Um, they were like the resistance yes, army, the pubs yeah. and that. And, and the thing is that they would. Um, Oh, it was the mores of the time, you yeah. know, when people like me were, you know, quite intimidating. Hence the reason why um, there'd be all this sort of um, ridiculing, you know, going on. And they were absolutely terrified little boys when you came back uh -huh. with something, especially if you found their Achilles heel and went for it, which, of course, Satan's mother did. <laughs> Master Lemmy <laughs> <laughs> So there was a bit of that there was there was some like uh untoward comments and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. There were there was quite a few racist, underhanded, homophobic, transphobics uh comments, but it was the mores of the time. But you know, I was very much into I'm the star of this fucking film. Yeah. And you will show me a modicum of respect, yeah. you know, unless you want to have an unenjoyable experience as well. <laughs> Which you know, sounds to I me... was forever having uh, uh, meetings with the producers, okay. you know, saying, I don't like it and I'm not having it and you better say something because wow. I don't care whether I've signed a fucking contract or not. I'll be fucking walking and wow. you won't have a movie. Yeah. You know, and you will be made to give the money back. Right. You know, so I, I, you know, I was like a threat with them. I don't think they quite knew 
what they were taking on, Mm -hmm. you know, because I went to work to produce something good. I was really, I've always had an attitude of gratitude, Mm. you know, and I just thought this is one of the best things that could ever happen to me, career-wise, life-wise, you know, script-wise, you know, head of the game-wise, you know. So I haven't come here to be disruptive. So please, you know, stop your stereotyping. Yeah. You know, stop your deliberate... Uh, transference because I'm not having that neither, Mm -hmm. you know, and just make sure that the decks are clear for me to do my work. Right. You know, Um, then, you know, there was all this game playing, you know, this gaslighting and I wasn't fucking having it. Yeah. You know, it's like the onus is on you. It's not on me. I'm here to work. Hmm. You know, and had you always had that with in relation to folks that you had to work with or in those situations? Well, I, th- I think when when you're a teenager, you're perplexed with things. The mores of the times, you know, you kind of play into it. But the more you get of it, if you're a certain type of person, individual, you soon find it irksome and tiresome, othering. You know, yeah. maybe maybe I just um, realized what othering was from, uh, you know, early onset. You know, it's yeah. like these days, you know, I say stuff on my Instagram and people will DM me and go, oh, that was a bit. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. You know, if Miriam Margulies say uh-huh. something like that, calls someone a cunt or, you know, a piece of shit or a fucking bastard or, you know, um, N- nothing unnoticed. said yeah. because of age and because of white privilege. But if I say it, you have to come back with this covert sort of disgusting response. Fuck off. Yeah. And your mother and father too. And I always think as well that people should bear in mind that if someone is a pioneer mm. of representation, that they should also be afforded certain things, yeah. uh, liberties, if you will, latitude, Yeah. Uh, because being a pioneer is not easy. No. And if there's certain things that maybe aren't um, harmonious with uh, the latest iteration mm-hmm. of what is acceptable language, well, consider the context, consider the person that it's coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, and also I think living an authentic life, you know, is difficult, especially in a world that is trying to tell you to be like everybody else. Sure. You know, I mean, I don't, I do, you know, this, we talk about alienation, but this world is very alien to me mm. as I've gotten older because all I see is this sort of conveyor belt to oblivion oh, yeah. mentality. Sure. You know, I'm sorry I have to keep pushing this up, but what's happening is that I'm wearing this bra underneath here and my tits are falling down underneath it. <laughs> and you have so those lovely buttons. If as you well. can give me a hand, anybody, <laughs> I'd be most grateful. I promise when I invoice you, it will be 50% off. <laughs> now- <laughs> Very fair pricing. Yeah. I've got to say, yes. But, um, but no, you know, in in a world, you know, where where you know you're supposed to be an individual, it, it, it's it's just it's a scam. It's like meritocracy. It's a myth. It's a scam. You know, every you know, we live in a world where <sighs> be, being truthful to yourself, or a, you know, like that thing, stand in the truth of who you are. Most of you don't know who the true you is. Mm. And sometimes a lot of those people use that kind of slippery language to give the impression yeah. of being yeah. aware. Virtue signaling, yeah. signaling right. is it called? You know, yeah. this virtue signal, signaling, you know, or anybody who is genuinely truthful, you know, and caring and empathetic you know, and has a kind of socialist view on things, then, then you're called a woke now and, which is now made to be a bad thing by the yes. right wing of both countries i think the u.s and the uk I mean, yeah. there's other countries, well but... i mean what, what what when is caring when when you know why does caring and, and social justice even need a word well and also it's the same thing as um when people make fun of people for being intellectually 
uh, adroit or uh, very learned or well read. Uh huh. It's the same thing. It's it's that bullying, yes. dumb yeah. perspective that just makes uh, it, it strives to make people who are caring or tr- striving for something uh-huh. to feel shit about themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, th- th- this is going to be the next um, war. The next uh-huh. big war is going to be on woke because they've got nothing left to attack. Here they can't attack Jeremy Corbyn. You know they can't attack Bernie Sanders <laughs> anymore. You know um, they can't uh, you use uh, Brexit as an excuse. So it's going to be those who are genuinely virtuous. Yeah, you know who are terrible. That's what they're, yeah, they're, they're trying to know, make it. They're doing that in the states. You yeah, know? To yeah. the schoolyard bully strikes again. Yeah, you know thick. But but I'm telling you, there is going to be a knockback and yeah. a big knockback. Absolutely. And if it, you know, and you know, it will not only come from the genuinely virtuous; it will come from Gaia mm. as well. Mm-hmm. You know. And not that that reminds me of this, but I've been meaning to ask you, uh, what was it like working with Stock Aiken Moderman on oh, Pistol in My Pocket? Um, well, again, such a mad theatrical creature am I. I mean, I was really quite mad, you know, when I was on hormones. I mean, I'm mad now, but in a different sort of way. And, um, and when did you start hormones? Oh, I, uh, Jane County actually gave me my first hormone injection yeah. of Premarin in, in uh, about 1983 when she was uh, didn't have anywhere to live in London. Mm-hmm. She'd come over to do all these shows. So I, she stayed with me in my little studio flat, my social housing studio flat uh, at the top of Hampstead Road uh, near Warren Street Station, Houston. Uh-huh. And um, she, she was very nervous about it. She said, now, are you sure? Are you sure about <laughs> this? And I said, yeah, go on, you know. And um, I hadn't really thought it through, but, you know, I knew, you know, that I needed to start the break. But she was very, very reluctant. <laughs> and, um, are you man enough to be a woman? And um, so, <coughs> sorry, just a little cough. Oh, yeah. Um. Oh God, that brand is really strong. <laughs> it really how's is. Yours? Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh how's oh. your English breakfast? Oh, uh, it's all bleep that. It's okay. Quite nice. Quite oh, nice. Oh, Very good. warming. Very oh, good, warming. Good. Good. And uh, I should have got you some cucumber sandwiches. Really. <laughs> oh, that'd be lovely sometimes. Sure. Dunk. And <laughs> um, but anyway, so Jane uh, gave me my first um, injection, and um, it sort of went from. There was the question about Stock Aiken and Waterman. Well, yeah, but this is uh, almost more interesting. And we'll get to Stock Aiken and Waterman and stuff because he said you were mad at the time because uh, you were starting hormones. And, oh. uh, I, so you started hormones. Yeah. And I'm curious about uh, what you were thinking about uh, leading up to that because at the time, it, were hormones um, illegal or was it? No, you could get hormones. Okay. You know? I mean, we'd had April Ashley and all these people before that. But I remember I used to have this really right wing conservative GP mm. in the next street um, called, uh, what was it? Uh, Martin Skur, I think. And I think he still does. Uh, he used to do a column for the mail and he refused to give them to me, I calling see. us kind of freaks, you know. Uh-huh. So he got a gob for as well yeah and um i think i actually made a complaint about him to mm-hmm. the medical council um but um anyway i had a great chemist who would sell them to me okay. you know and uh then you know i went to the through the proper channels to the transgender clinic at charing cross because I needed to talk things through, well, you know, rather than a do a DIY sure. thing. The best thing for me to do um, after I'd, you know, been paying for hormones, uh, or, uh, tr- uh, medication off um, this very uh, compassionate Chinese chemist yeah. um, was to make an official uh, appointment at the transgender clinic. So I got a different GP, went to the transgender clinic. And uh, they said, uh, you know, so I went through the official channels, you know, channel, yeah. 
now. Sure. And um, sorry, my tits keep coming down. Again. <laughs> and um, they're like two aspirins on an ironing board, <laughs> and um, like two nap bites. And, and what was the the care like at that time for transgender? Uh, the people? care was. I think it progressed quite a bit. And you got to see a psychiatrist that seemed to be more empathetic, but quite forensic. Well, mm -hmm. what is it like being a woman? Oh, I see. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. what do you mean when you say you're a woman, what do you feel like? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so you had to ask to these, well, I don't know. What's it like being a man? Do we, does any of us know what a man is? Right. You know, um, are you repulsed by your body image in the mirror? No. You know. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, want to do this. Sorry. It's just, I just want to do this. It's yeah. not because yes, of an aversion know. or yes. disgust or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, for my particular situation, I don't know what male or female is. You know, and to me, like gender is not about being uh, a male or a female, uh, you know, uh, being male or female is not gender behavior to me. It's human behavior. Sure. You know, and I think you have to look beyond form. But I am with, and this is going to sound very unpopular, I don't actually care it's not up to me how somebody identifies as a gender sure or as a person you know and um you know they can use the argument yeah well you know uh, if if uh, a cow's born in a stable it doesn't make it a horse you know but that doesn't even make you fucking human either you know yeah i mean you came out of your mother's twat that don't make you human <laughs> In my eyes, sure. you know, um, probably a waste of DNA would be more uh, descriptive. <laughs> um, but, um, but you know, all these stupid arguments, you know, when it's about speaking in the language of cliche, we're dealing with human beings, you know. Yeah. Now, you either want to go along with something that you see as somebody's delusion or you don't. But at the end of the day, you should pay a modicum of respect you know and i don't see where the problem is other than with you if you have to look between somebody else's legs and then decide how you should treat them yeah what is lacking in you you know yeah you know their behavior is their behavior what goes up their ass don't give you a fucking headache let's right. you know yeah so um so i don't know what male or female is you know i just know that i'm a field of light dancing of itself yeah. and i'm a multidimensional being and i obviously need to look like this you know this version of me yeah and that's you know, how don't you... forget i've been yeah. alan alana lana lana Alan, Alana, Lana, Lana. We're not these bodies. We're spirit souls. Never dying. <laughs> always flying. Spirit souls. Are they paying for this channel? Uh, now they are. After oh, that, good, they have to. They have good. to. But I'm curious, uh, when did you arrive at what you just said in terms of philosophy or have you always felt like that when you were starting the hormones where was your head at in relation to that i've always i've i've i think anybody who has who treads a rocky path has always tread a very spiritual path you know because it's only stars can't shine without the dark basically yeah you know and it's not the happy times that gives you the most uh, profound lessons, sure. is it? No. You know, so, you know, and um, they say that this thing, uh, re religion is for people who say you're going to go to hell. Spiritualism is for those of us who've already been there several times, you know, <laughs> yeah. and put the shits up, Satan. <laughs> um, I also, you know, when I started doing uh, hormones, got into that thing where a lot of transsexuals get into absolutely having a violent, aggressive, knee-jerk reaction to anybody that misgenders them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think 
anybody can take a micro idea and push it to a meta one. Sure. You know. And that I'm guessing that that would be like the thing that symbolized all of the oppression and uh, othering. Yes, yes. And, well, you, you know, it was another sort of uh, slap in the face, you know. And um, so I went through that period where I would just really break somebody. And I suppose, you know, that might have been because underneath my own ignorance that I had an insight into that we were beyond form, mm -hmm. you know, but I was very intolerant of anybody else because I, I know what abuse is covertly, overtly. I know what the nuances are. I know what the micro behaviors are. Yeah. And um, I certainly wasn't having anybody, you know, attacking my Achilles heel gaslighting in order to elevate them to a high status by relegating me to a lower one. Exactly. So I certainly, you know, was as sharp as a bread knife on that from Sure. Now that's also a, a form of self protection as well. Yes. And yeah. How did that interrelate with romantic liaisons? Oh well, you know, you'd always uh, I mean, that was the other thing, you know, I mean I think like you can there's an element of trans, transism, if you like, transsexuality, where I noticed, and myself included, it was also a part of the price that you were prepared to pay in order to be loved, in order to fulfill this old sort of concept and adage of being worthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've learned since being single. I am single, by the way. And um, that... <laughs> and um, that... Um, Get in touch with the links in the episode description. Please do. Um, I have uh, since learned that uh, being... Um, you know, you're not a less sadder a person just because you're with somebody. Sure. You know, and as I say, being on my own has served as a symbol of my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, part of my transsexuality at the beginning was about respectability politics. I'm thinking, oh, if I can't find uh, love as, uh, you know, pretending to be a natal male, you know, then I'll get it as a woman not realising that natal females, really attractive ones, have never found anybody in the world, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that being with somebody doesn't necessarily fix you. Oh, sure. You know, like the people who find their, yeah. their so-called uh, soulmates, you know, are at loggerheads, you right. know? So, no, it's all an inside job, you know? But part of that was to do with it, and I know that part of that is to do with... Mm -hmm. many transsexuals journey i will find the love of my life and and settle down to something that is quite normal there's no such thing as normal sure and a lot of people do uh, pursue various things in their lives mm. because of that notion that if i am this or i am that yes. this will lead to the perfect partner yeah and therefore the perfect life. Yes, well, it's like putting something away in a bottom drawer going, oh, I'll use that when the occasion arises. Well, the occasion is now. Sure. You know, self-love is all about the here and now, you but, know. But you said uh, also that you did fall into that trap of thinking that way for a yeah. while. Yeah. And how long would you say that that went on for? Oh, God, that went on for a few years. You yeah. know, that was all part and parcel of the whole convoluted you know journey thing sure but i don't but you know that that is not just to do with you know a trans sure journey. No, no, that no. was to do with the human yeah. journey yeah, yeah you but, know, but as, it was also occurring at the same time yes in the yes 80s. yeah yeah and uh, how long was your time on hormones you said you're not on hormones now so i'm curious how long um 
Well, I, I've sort of done hormones, you know, uh, intermittently, off and on, off and on. And funnily enough, I was at the transgender clinic yesterday for my two-year uh, checkup. Uh-huh. And at a certain age, you, you have to stop taking hormone pills. Oh, I see. Because they're actually bad, I think, after about 50. Oh, okay. They're actually of a detriment to your kidneys and can be more, uh, make you more susceptible to strokes and things. So, you know, after 50, you have to t- change to patches or a gel. Of course, there's a shortage on at the moment, you know, uh-huh. for that. And um, so... <sighs> So it's an intermittent thing then. Uh, I guess I, maybe I didn't understand that it is in uh, rounds or whatever. You, or you take it for yeah. a course. Yeah, well, I used then... to do sort of like a, a month on and a month off. But, of course, mm. you know, that messes up your system because your system thinking, God, what's this daft fucker doing? You know, it's like <laughs> revving up the car, the car and stopping it. So I'm going to, you know, you do like patches now for the whole sort of a low dose. You know, you put a patch on your ass. Uh, for a more yeah. consistent amount of time or more. Con- uh, well, just uh, for the whole all, all year. The time. Yeah, I you see. change them twice a week, uh-huh. you know. And, um, but, you know, I think I'm a work in progress, you know. Everyone is. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd like to do one of those um, from, what do you call it, Dr. Swan programs, oh, okay. yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I'm a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I'm like a room that needs redecorating every now and again. <laughs> Aren't we all, though? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, we, we really are, and we're always yeah. changing. Well, you don't need anything done. Why, oh, thank you. But apparently, right. the nose, you said earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want, you know, well, I'll but get... in our minds, though, you know, the way that we look at the world, uh, yeah. our philosophies, or just our life situation, we always, like you said before, we always need to sort of be present yeah. uh, and aware of yeah. how we're interacting with others and our Ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, I get conflicted over like um, cosmetic surgery and thing. And I just think, oh, is this people just buying into this capitalist idea, this construct of beauty and stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, or yes, and some of it is, is like having Botox and, you know, shit put in your face, you know, fillers and stuff. I mean, again, entirely up to the individual. Sure. But, you know, are we, is this all about, you know, status quo? You and know, I can afford to have this done, you know, which seems a bit vapid to me. Uh, and I've seen uh, on the other side of the coin, I've seen people have nose jobs and chin jobs and eye jobs, and it's just removed a whole mental illness from them. Sure. It's you relief. Know, it's uh, it, it's like, you know, when certain trans people look at themselves, you know, and are absolutely repulsed and terrified and mentally uh, disturbed by their accoutrement. Sure. To me, that is a mental illness. You know, that's not a very popular opinion. Mm -hmm. But that mental illness is resolved once gender reassignment so, you, you know, you're referring to like the dysphoria as the dysphoria. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, and I th- I just think, you know, if if uh, if surgery can help somebody live, you know, a better life in a tumultuous world, if it helps them get through the mire, because that's something that we all have in common, regardless of how we self identify, is that we all have to fucking traipse through shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's a great leveler. So I'm just all for what people need, you know, yeah. um, to get through, you sure. know, because life is either too long or too short, <laughs> you know? Um, but I do feel, you know, and I say that about about trans that I've just said because of anecdotal evidence, you know, and I get a lot of people on the trans spectrum DMing me, you know, and I've obviously because of my life and who I am and what I seem to represent, people will come up and tell me their life story. Sure. You know, and, um, you know, I, I say, I say, you know, I say that with compassion for people, mm-hmm. you know, but equally, you know, 
I have issues with people and there's people that I don't want. And just because I have something in familiar with you doesn't mean to say I'm compatible. Sure. Neither. So let's get real about that as well. But what we don't want, we don't want people being violently attacked, either verbally or physically, because they are going through whatever phase they are going through, yeah. whatever experience they are going through in order to get through. Right. You know, yeah. we want a modicum of respect for everybody, yeah. you know. And, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, what your opinion is of me is none of my business. Well, you know, and I think it's a good uh, yeah. general philosophy to live with. Well, but... because reputation by definition, mm -hmm. look it up, means of the per people's opinion. But your character's your own. Right. You know, and nobody can interfere with that. You know, they cannot call you all the sods under the sun. But if you know, you know you're not the type of sod that they uh, <laughs> are you referring, know, see, that you are, yeah. referring to, then yeah. what does it matter? I'd, anyway, I've, I've, I'm too fucking old and far out and fabulous to fucking care. To <laughs> well, before we close out, though, I, I would like to get back to the stock ache and Waterman. Oh, yes. Uh, time because it's, but it's interesting that you said that you were uh, mad at the time from the newness of the hormones. So this is uh, around the time that you're, uh, entering into getting a record contract. Yeah. What was the lead into that? What prompted your well, collaboration? I, 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 I tracked down Stock Aiken and Waterman because um, I wanted a hit record and precisely that, a hit record. They were the hit factory. Oh, yeah. So Peter Waterman was a fan of the comic strip presents, knew exactly who I was, knew that I was like transitioning. I said, I want, you know, I've got... A, I've got a couple of tracks I want, you know, I want to, uh, oh, that was it. I said, I've got a track. I want to come over, play it to your office. So I'll sing it to you, Pete. He said, oh, yeah, will you sing it to us in the office? So I went over there and so sang him this, in this big office with all these model trains all around, big train enthusiasts. And um, so I went in there, you know, looking like a Shaka Khan plane crash with all <laughs> and um so uh but just he, to, let me just throw a, a dart in that for a second i was at someone's home recently that was a, formerly a recording studio oh right and shaka khan had recorded there not only had she recorded there she broke the toilet now we thought <laughs> it was the handle no she broke the cistern oh right. so if anyone out there has any information on that story please get in touch because that's quite a remarkable feat yeah. Uh, one of many that Shaka has uh, achieved. but And back to your story. Well, bless her. She's a big girl, but she's also got handbags. She could have afforded to have that re, you know. And she may well have. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. But I know she, you know, she, maybe she was partying. Who knows what could have happened. Well, I had a nice night out with a good few years ago, about 20 years ago, yeah. when she was uh, in a show with Doris Troy here called Mama, I Want to Sing at the Cambridge Theatre. And she was an absolute delight, you know. Um, but so I'll always have a, a soft spot for Shakalan, 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 Shakalan. Yeah, tremendous drummer. She We've is got as well. the love of a lifetime. It's such a rock steady love. And um, <laughs> but um, so you went in looking uh, like oh, so I went in looking like a Shaka Khan plane crash. And um, so he said, oh, so what's this song? So I said, oh, I'll sing it for you, Pete. It goes. Surrender your gender, a gender bender. Surrender your gender, a gender bender. Well, Pete pissed himself laughing. <laughs> and then he fell on the floor laughing. And I just sat there thinking, how rude. And... <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, when it when he eventually composed himself, he said, "Well, it's a very interesting song, but I think we might have something a bit better for you uh -huh. it's from Leeds, right?" So I said, "Oh well, I welcome that, Pete." I said, um, "But I must have a hit, and he, yeah, it'd be a hit for Yolana." He goes, "Um, 
you know, I'll give you a ring in a week. Anyway, week, week went by. It was 10 days. I thought, I can't wait anymore with yeah. bated breath. Rang him up and I said, oh, Pete. Oh, hello, Lana. You know, he said, um, can you come in tomorrow and record this uh, song? He said, we'll give you a bit of time to learn it because Morrison and Washbourne are here who wrote it. Uh-huh. You know, we're producing it. Uh, come in and, uh, you know, learn it and then we'll start recording it straight away. So I went in and it was about 10 a.m. in the morning and Rick Astley, I don't know whether you know Rick Astley. Oh, yeah, certainly. He was the tea boy. Oh, wow. There making your toast and coffee. Yeah. Um, and cups of tea. And he was very sweet, but obviously very nervous of me, right? And But anyway, he was lovely. And uh, so... I recorded, I got a pistol in my pocket, baby. I got it pointed at you. And um, so that's how all that transpired. And then Sheila Ferguson heard it and said to Pete, oh, I think it needs, you know, Sheila Ferguson of the three degrees. Oh, yes. When will I see you again? You're a dirty old man. You can't keep your hands. <laughs> so uh, Sheila heard it, said, oh, it needs to have um, a bit of bulk on it, you know. Yeah. So um, let me do some vo- uh, additional vocals. So, yeah. so originally she did, oh, is that a pistol in your pocket? A p- p- pistol in your pocket. Are you just pleased to see me? <laughs> you know, and she did all that and the uh, backing BVs yeah. on it. And, you know, it, it, it became, a, you know, a hit. But unfortunately, um, I was a bit of a cunt at the time <laughs> as, as well. <laughs> and I don't think that certainly didn't go in my favour, especially with average beige type people you know because the music industry is full of people that should be selling hoover washing machines sure. really yeah and um well it's not quite geared for genuinely outre type people mm-hmm. you know these these sort of outrageous people that we see now have to be invented you know if you stayed up 10 nights i don't know seven nights for 10 weeks you couldn't have invented me right uh, uh, and, um, but, Which makes people like that uncomfortable. Yeah, they didn't have a hand in the creation. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, what happened was um, they wrote a song called "I Can Make a Man Out of You" if you want me to. Which I might actually do when next year I play the um, the eighties festival. Oh yeah, uh, Rewind. I oh, think fab. it is. Yeah. Um, so, um, but, um, yeah, that, that was a flop. So they lost sort of interest. They lost interest because of that, which I didn't, uh, there was a song called something about it's a beautiful world, which I wanted to do, but no, they insisted on doing this. I can make a man out of you. I think to get rid of me, um, because I wasn't all that pliable, Sure, you know, um, And maybe, you know, that's stupid of me. Maybe I should have played the game, you know, fake it till you make it, you know, that sort of thing. But what kind of uh, things were the companies, the record companies asking you to do that you wouldn't want to do? Well, you know, just very um, predictable things. You know, when I wanted to do a bit of rock and roll, when I wanted to merge rock and roll with punk, when I wanted to merge punk with funk, and yeah. stuff, you know, when I wanted to be something more than uh, something in a frock on hormones, you know. Sure. I wanted the art to take over. Yeah. Just like in Eat the Rich, you know, in yeah. Eat the Rich, there's no mention of trans or anything like that in no. Eat the Rich. You know, just like in real life, you know, you just get on with stuff that person yeah. is. You're uh, Alex in the movie. Yes. And that's pretty much that, it. Yes, that person is who they are. Yeah. You know, we don't have to draw attention to it. That's like putting a microphone in front of a 600 pound comedian that weighs 600 pound and them going, oh, I'll move the mic, you know, so you can see me. It's like. <laughs> 
Yeah. We can see what you are and we can think our own thoughts. Sure. You know, yeah. and you will educate us, uh, you know, from there. Yeah. So you, you didn't know. want to be a novelty. Yes. No, no. And I know like, you know, show business is about partly about being novel, a novelty. I mean, everybody's got their USP, you know, uh, a PR will go, oh, that is the catchphrase. That's the quote. Surprise, surprise, you know, little black. Are you having a laugh? So you know, yeah, you yeah. know, or um, nice to see ya, to see ya, nice. You know, so everyone's got that sort of yeah. novelty yeah. Um, element to it. But, but it's better when it's just extracted from yeah. the overall body of work instead of the sole focus. Yeah, yeah. I think in many ways I was way ahead of my time in my thinking. But, of course... They weren't. They weren't going to have Boy George eclipsed. You know, they weren't going to mm. have Pete eclipsed. All the queer fraternity at the time were white-skinned yeah. people. You know, and that's not to say that any of these people were racist, but you know, they benefited from racism. Mm -hmm. um, but they certainly wasn't going to have a black trans queer whatever i suppose to be dictating terms and conditions it's the mores of the times you sure. know and and even today you know it's like i have like black people you know say ask me what color i am mm -hmm. most recently um i had uh <sighs> I compared at a, a black pride mm -hmm. and um but before that, I was asked by the organizer, what color I'm hmm. supposed, you know, yeah, I was, you know, what, what yeah. my origins were. Um, and it was kind of odd, but then I thought, well, I'm not, I don't have, you know, have the same skin hue tone as yourself. But, you know, I'm definitely black, you know, and my experiences of uh, ostracism, flat ridicule and oppression have come because of my, the color of my skin. Yeah. Probably more sometimes than, you know, my uh, manner or idiosyncrasy, mm -hmm. you know. But then I've always been hit with those two prejudices. Sure. Throughout my life. Um, you know, there was a... a um, I met a guy in here, the the supper club, who um, was do was a researcher on a black uh, chat program recently. I think it was on Channel Four, and I said, um, "Oh, I, I know that show. I, I should be a guest on it." And he goes, "But the thing is, Lana, you're not really black enough." <laughs> this this was. In this day and age, yeah. you're not really black enough. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. You know, yeah. I bet I've been called the N word more than you. Sure. You know, yeah. um, and so, you know, you're up against that prejudice, you know. I mean, you know, I could go on being bitter, you know, <laughs> but I'm not bitter, I'm better. Yeah. You no, know, I'm always better. But, you know, certainly this things like um, I, I watch and think, well, why haven't I been approached? Yeah, it's about... strange that you haven't been asked to do RuPaul's Drag Race UK, much less the United Absol States version. You yeah. know, just like as a one off guest. Well, you you're know, guest judge, guest, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, things like um, cameos in It's a Sin. You know, because, I mean, I actually were, was there in the 80s with many other people yeah. fighting uh, Thatcher's, you know, prejudice. You know, this, this. Oh, anyway, I don't, I, I don't want to come over as if sure. like I'm bitter, well, but I am. <laughs> well, but <laughs> then let's move on to another musical project that you did a musical play with Andy Bell from Erasure. Mm -hmm. That was Torsten, yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it was fantastic working with Andy, um, who's quite he's hilarious in his own way. Um, but he's kind of like, he doesn't know he's funny. And oh, he is, okay. I, he is funny. Um, but um, 
he did forget all his lines, poor Andy. So I said to the producers, oh, well, just record all his, get him in early and record all his lines. And when he has to do lines, you know, have played through the stage speakers as if it's like thought coming out of his head. They thought that was a great uh, resolution, you know, resolved it perfectly. Good tip for anyone out there in a Mm. working in a theater production with this problem. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because Andy's a great pop star. Yeah. You know, sublime pop star. He's not an actor, you know. And um, so anyway, uh, he played Torsten, this 500 year old sort of, young man you know that yeah. doesn't age like a dorian gray type character i still don't understand what the play was about but you know the music was quite good uh it got edited a lot because the writer got carried away thinking he was this very sort of a boast verbose uh, etymologist, you know, and sure. with all this grandeur. And I was saying, you know, to the director, oh, cut this shit, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like somebody repeating themselves on a, you know, record. Yeah. Um, and Sometimes uh, people need an editor. They absolutely, including myself. And, <laughs> um, no, I need a swear box, I think. I've got Tourette's on that front. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, there was this other character, the legendary Peter Straker was ah, on yes. it, who was very close to um, Freddie Mercury. Mm. And Peter Straker was considered to be the Black Bowie in the UK in his time. Yeah. But um, anyway. Freddie, Freddie produced one of his records, I believe, right? Who? Freddie produced his, that's right, uh, yeah. one of his records. And um, anyway, so uh, they wrote this uh, role for me, Lady B- Demina Bazaar, and she was very uh bizarre but um i actually enjoyed doing it. i actually jumped out of bed you know yeah. in the morning to well it wasn't the morning it wasn't till about half 12 that I got. <laughs> that's but, that's theater morning though, yeah, yes it? you know well it's the adrenaline isn't it and um but anyway um it was fantastic and I was surprised that his fans came from all over the world, you know, from L.A., from San Francisco, Vegas, you know. And they'd some of them had actually bought tickets, you know, for the whole uh, run. Yeah, I think it was 25 performances and they bought tickets at 25 pound. Wow. You know, um, you know, and, and like accommodation and everything. And I thought, now this is quite deranged, you know. <laughs> I've never known anyone do this until like these two from Australia mm-hmm. had done the same thing to come and see me. You know, so I was like, oh, I, I better keep my gob short. <laughs> yeah. I guess this does make sense. I thought it was crazy, but yeah, now yeah. that I see this, this yeah. makes sense. But then... I think for some people, you do become a religion for them. Well, and also an opportunity to see you in this type of production that showcases all of your many talents. And I remember that this guy had come from Australia, sort of, we thought thought he was, you know, fainted a bit when he met me, you Uh know. So, (laughs) talk about... Talk about knock them dead. <laughs> well, it's nice to be reminded of it every once in a yes, while, right? Because yeah. you can forget because it's just what you do. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. Well, this is why I don't like lead, uh, meeting fans, just in case they You're faint, on the wrong side faint of on the, you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then you're liable, yeah. right? You know. Yeah. I don't want them to faint or fart on me, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's Boris or a fan, this is how <laughs> we feel. Now, uh, I, I was curious. You mentioned the adrenaline and... After a show, what is? Do you have a routine to sort of come down from the onstage well, high? Well, yeah. Normally, what the routine is: um, no alcohol after a show. I don't. I don't drink when I uh, perform or I'm in a run. Mm-hmm. Um, I always take care of my diet, so really, very little to no sugar. Yeah. Very uh, low carbs. Um, so I'm quite healthy in that way, you know, and if I can walk to the venue and walk back, you know, yeah. I'm happy because I don't want to be going to the gym and lifting weights. You need all your stamina for the 
sure. invest in the performance. Um, so um, post performance, because it, you know, I mean, even pre performance, it's a very high adrenaline moment. Sure, you know, sure, because you don't know whether you're going to walk on them. People are going to love you or despise you. You know, so it's very high adrenaline moment. Yeah. But luckily, people do adore me, and I give it back, adore them back. Yeah. Um, but um, after a performance, it's usually saying hello to people. If it's winter, not allowing them to kiss you or anything yeah. like that. Um, so saying hello to people, um, just hanging out a bit with, with the cast or whoever, the band, whoever. Yeah. And then getting home, shower, serums on, nighty on, cup of tea, maybe a bit of a horror film or a bit of a feel-good film. Yeah. And then I'm ready to sleep. Uh, tidy up, plump cushions. Sure, things, sure, yeah. You know, make sure that um, your kitchen bin's not full. That needs emptying. Um so that's the sort of thing. And um, I suppose on the day of a performance, I'm the lines are going over in my head. Yeah. And um, I, tr I tend to remember lines more if I'm doing something. Okay. You yeah. know. So, oh, so you went there, did you? Um, you went to Piccadilly Circus. And that man in the brown suit said, you know, so I tend to remember things when I'm doing Active stuff. Active and engaged um, or something, yeah. And I will sing a bit throughout uh -huh. the day so that my vocals are... You know, I do like vocal lessons. Ness and Dorma. So I do, you know, some vocals. So I'm yeah. just ready for the performance. And Andy actually does about uh, 15 minutes of professional warm-up. Warm, warm -up. But I don't believe that. I think... Uh, you can do two to three minutes of perfect, you know, vocal yeah. exercises and you're covered there. Do you yeah. think they've got a band down? I think it sounds that way. I think Elizabeth has brought the band on and she's just rocking out full right. on in the front. The bloody I, neighbors in this building. I know. <laughs> I know. Outrageous. No, no <laughs> compassion at all. Uh, no, no sense. But uh, I think I guess we should wrap up then. It's been such a wonderful chat. Oh, thank you, Craig. Well, thank you, Lana. Well, um, it's just been lovely meeting you, and um, I hope you know this episode will be a success for you. And love to all your viewers, especially my fans there, wherever you are. And um, I just think I just hope life gets better for all of us because we're all the precariat at the moment. But I do believe in the fact that. If you do whatever good you can from wherever you are with whatever you've got, then it just produces good results. So just keep being kind to yourself and everybody else. And now I'm going to turn into Dorothy Squires. And when <laughs> I want to love you, say it with flaws. That's perfect. I can't think uh, of uh, anything better to add to that. And uh, since we got to go join the party downstairs, yes. do our number. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you once again. I'm Thank so you, thrilled Craig. that we could do this and uh, to do the retake, too, which has been wonderful. Oh. And thank you again for the lovely presence. And I look forward to the next time. And also, in the meantime, everyone, go to Lana, Be Lit, and Be Learning. And there's links for that in this episode description, wherever you're watching or listening to it. Till next time, folks. Bye. Bye bye.